Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. Have you ever... Ex- <laughs> I'm realizing that this is a very like heavy question, just starting off oh, here at the top. Okay. Uh, well, maybe. I mean, so have you ever experienced heat exhaustion? Like just b- beyond just being uncomfortable, which we all, we both have talked about before. Yeah. I do not like the heat. Probably not. I feel like I would remember if I... You've never. I guess not, right? Because like I would close remember. to passing out or something. No. Oh well, I pass out all. That's a terrible thing to say. I pass out all the time. <laughs> I pass out a lot, but it's like from like high and low blood pressure or whatever. Oh, right? I see. Okay, but, um, so yeah, not heat related. No, no. Have you had like heat exhaustion? I so I do not tolerate the heat well. Let's no. put it that way. I've never, I've never actually passed out, but. The closest I ever got was, I don't know, this was a handful of years ago at a baseball game here in yeah. D.C. at Nats Park. And it was one of the, it was, I think it was a literally a hundred degree day. Right. We were in direct sunlight. Ugh. And I just, I was with my partner and my, my brother and sister-in-law. And I just remember this moment where everything's going fine, hunky-dory. We're all sweating, of course. And... I don't know. I lean forward. Yeah. And everything just kind of like <gasps> gets a little weird. And I looked at, I don't even know who I looked at one. And I was like, I, I think I might pass out. And immediately like, they like ripped me up and like pulled me back into the shade and got me a bunch of water. And I yeah. didn't. Oh, uh, but yeah, that was, that was the closest. And then it was fine. I, I again, got some water on me. Everything was good. That was the closest I ever, I ever got to that. But unfortunately I feel like that might be a, one, I'm much more conscious about where I sit at games now. I know where the shade is. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, it's tough going to games. It's, I'm a big baseball fan, but it's tough going to games, especially in the summer, because I feel like we're just getting more and more of these like epically hot, really warm, direct sunlight. Yeah, <laughs> epically hot. Yeah, so maybe I'll just, uh, I still want to go to baseball, but yeah. I guess I'll just try to take a little bit better care of myself in the future. Or you can get an umbrella hat. Or I can get an umbrella hat. Thank Uh you, Vicky, for solving everything for me. (laughs) You're welcome. Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicky Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right, so this is a climate-themed series, and while I have some guesses, I'm not entirely sure about the direct connections uh, between something like heat exhaustion and studying the climate, but I think our producer, Katrina Jackson, can help us make that connection. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Shane. All right, so connect the dots for us. Yeah, so this episode is all about the health effects of climate change. The health effects. That's there's so many directions we can go with that, right? Yeah, I mean it's uh, the, so I guess connecting the dots. Aforementioned things like heat exhaustion or mm-hmm. heat stroke or stuff like that. I mm-hmm. air quality maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a whole number of different things, right? Yeah, yeah. And when you think of all the different ways that climate change is impacting the Earth, like. With changes to the weather and natural disasters and the locations of different habitats and biomes and then how each of those things affects humans and our bodies, there's just a whole lot to study. So so I talked with Dr. Christy E. Bai, who is a professor at the University of Washington, and she actually founded a research group called the Center for Health and the Global Environment. Great. Let's hear it. So what is the Center for Health in the Global Environment, and and why did you start it? It's an initiative to work across campus, to work across the different schools and colleges, to bring health into the climate change research and practice that's ongoing at the University of Washington. One of the biggest challenges we face in climate change and health is, until now, the almost complete lack of funding. Every research domain says we don't have enough funding. And I very much appreciate that people listening to this are going to say, well, everybody says that. But the funding really has been absolutely minuscule. Starting at the very beginning, we need to understand the relationships between literally hundreds of different health outcomes 
and how temperature, precipitation, or changing weather patterns could affect the magnitude and pattern of those health outcomes. The research has been so small that most of that research has been focused on just, just a tiny handful. Heat, in particular, has received most of the funding. Dengue fever, malaria, and then a, a smattering of other publications in other areas. And so we don't have a fundamental understanding in most cases of what we might have to ex what we might have to prepare for with a change in climate. So can you talk to me about some of the major health effects of I'll just go through kind of a list of different extreme weather events that are becoming more common with co with climate change. So what are some of the major health effects of heat waves, for example? We know that one population, particularly at risk, are adults over the age of 65. Their physiological mechanisms are less effective, and they're less well able to tell when they're getting into trouble with the heat. When you look after a heat wave, about half of the excess deaths are from cardiovascular causes. These are people, for example, who die of a heart attack who would not have had a heart attack. And so anyone over the age of 65 is considered at higher risk. We also have outdoor workers who are exposed to very high temperatures in some of the work that they do. There's only four states in the U.S. that have regulations to protect outdoor workers during the heat. I live in one of those states. And so the state takes action during heat waves to help really protect those outdoor workers. Pregnant women are at higher risk. There is a robust literature that has been emerging over the last few years showing that pregnant women, when exposed to heat waves during the last trimester of pregnancy, and probably just towards the end of that trimester, have a higher prevalence of low birth weight babies. So the babies are smaller and that can have consequences for the baby. And so there's a lot of medical interventions to help protect these low birth weight babies. You mentioned that heat waves has some of the most funding for, for studying their impacts on health. What do we know about some of the major health effects of other extreme weather events like drought, floods, and, and wildfires? For wildfires, there's quite a bit of research developing about the consequences of the exposure to the particulate matter in wildfire. The way most air pollution is measured is by particulate matter. And what we care about is a particle of a particular size. It's called fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. When we inhale it, it is just the right size. It goes deep into our lungs, gets attached to our lung tissue, and then ultimately gets absorbed into the body. Thousands of studies show that exposure to high concentrations of particulate matter can lead to higher rates of lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, other kinds of chronic diseases. Looking particularly at wildfires, it appears that, first of all, the particulate matter from wildfires may be more toxic than the other kinds of particulate matter. So research is, is working to sort that out. Flooding has a range of health impacts associated with it. The one where there's been more research recently is on mental health. There are several studies that followed communities after a major flooding event. And usefully, they separated the people in the community to those who were not affected at all. Those who lived in a residence that was affected but not actually flooded, so it was disrupted. Floodwaters came to the front door but didn't come into the residence. And people who were actually flooded. That particular study has three years of follow-up. And you can imagine immediately after the flooding, the rates of anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder went up significantly higher in people who lived in a residence that was affected, less so than a people who lived in a residence that was dis disrupted. Mental health also is an issue with drought. There are studies out of Australia showing that in some of the traditional farming areas where there's been long-term drought, there's higher rates of suicide as farmers lose property that have been in their families for decades and decades. And so you can see these 
rather direct health impacts, but you can also start thinking about these somewhat more indirect health impacts of thinking about farmers losing their livelihoods, of people in flooded areas losing their livelihoods. And that, of course, also has consequences for health. It definitely makes sense that in addition to the obvious direct health impacts, that mental health would also be an issue following some of these traumatic weather and climate-related events. Sure, but people have been dealing with droughts for a long time and floods and wildfires basically forever. So how do we figure out what health effects are actually caused by climate change? Yeah, it's definitely tricky and it involves a lot of math and statistics. Chris was telling me about a whole field within climate science called detection and attribution. There's a field within climate science called detection and attribution that for 15 years or more has been looking particularly at extreme weather climate events. It's a sophisticated set of statistical tools that does exactly what the name applies. That first, it determines whether there's been a change in a trend. And second, if there has been a change in a trend, to what degree could that be attributable to climate change? The Pacific heat dome that occurred a year and a half ago or so here in the Pacific Northwest did have a detection and attribution study done. And the conclusion was the event was virtually impossible without climate change. And once we have that in the health sector, we can then look at the health impacts. Across Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, the current estimate is around 800 excess deaths. These are 800 people who would not have died during that period otherwise. So we can say those are 800 people who died because of climate change. We're still working on the methods on the health sector side, and we've got a couple of publications that are under review showing how these methods can be applied to the health sector and moving beyond just the extreme weather and climate events to other concerns, vector-borne diseases, for example. This is a place where there is quite a bit of development going on, and we'll see advances hopefully pretty soon. What are one or two key areas of research or maybe data sets that you really wish existed? Like if they existed, it would make understanding one aspect of these problems so much easier. I've had the privilege of spending quite a lot of time in low and middle income countries. Most of them just don't have the health data you need. We do have temperature records. People have been putting out thermometers, brain gauges for 150 years. There's long records around the weather data. Many countries have just very limited health data. And when they do, they may only collect the data monthly. And you can imagine you can have a whole disease outbreak within a month and have it go away. And so you can't really do the statistical analysis you need to do because you don't have fine enough scale for the health data. And so having health data is critically important and making sure that we find ways to improve our surveillance so we continue collecting those data and have ways for those data to be more available, acknowledging that we have to abide by all of the human subjects' research restrictions, which are really important. But at the same time, if we don't have those kinds of data, we're not going to be able to help to the extent that we can as public health professionals in understanding what kinds of interventions do you need urgently and immediately to protect against, for example, an outbreak of disease. We just don't have the data at the moment. So in terms of trying to plan for all these effects, health effects from climate change, how are health organizations doing on incorporating some of this research into their management strategies? I know you're talking about there needs to be a lot more research done, but are Is the research that's being done being incorporated into a lot of health organizations' strategies? The first step that ministries of health need to take is to conduct what's called a vulnerability and adaptation assessment. And that does what the name implies. It identifies its vulnerability today to the climate change that's already happened 
and identifies what's going to possibly happen in the future in terms of their risk, and then uses that information to think about how they need to modify their policies and programs. Every other year, the World Health Organization surveys its member states. It's about 196, I think. The last survey was in 2021. First of all, only 95 countries responded. Of those, only half had a vulnerability and adaptation assessment. And of that half, only, I think it was nine countries, said they had the human and the financial resources they needed to start taking action. When you look at the funding on adaptation under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, less than half of 1% of all of their funding has gone to health. So at the moment, health is in a situation where people are suffering and dying from climate change. And at the same time, the sector doesn't have the human and financial resources to start taking action. Part of the taking action is it's incredibly rare for anybody in health to take any kind of courses in meteorology, courses in climate change. And so very, very few people in departments and ministries of health really understand weather, climate, and climate change. And so it's been outside of their remit. It's been outside of what they think about. The good news is things are changing rapidly. Schools of public health now understand how critical understanding our changing climate is. And they're all starting programs. They're all starting courses on climate change and health. There's been several calls for proposals from the National Institutes of Health this year and starting last year, which is very exciting. So if we were to talk a couple of years from now, I think the answers would be a lot different because we would have the investment in the research and importantly, the investment in the interventions and start seeing that we are having communities more resilient to the health risks of a changing climate. So things have come a long way and there's still a long way to go. And it's great to know that there's a lot of progress being made in researching the health impacts of climate change and getting that knowledge considered by various countries' health ministries. Yeah, it's so impressive that researchers were able to estimate how people died in specific heat wave that wouldn't have died if we weren't pumping a bunch of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and, and frankly, just changing the global climate that's terrible, obviously. But frankly, from a scientific perspective, pretty impressive that we can work out the specific numbers like that. Yeah. And like Chris said, hopefully soon there will be those types of detection and attribution studies done for other climate events as well. So I'm guessing that Chris has been working on all of this for a pretty long time. Yes, she has. And so if you want to hear about how the field of health and climate has evolved over the years, Chris is a great person to ask. So shifting a bit to your your own career, how long have you been studying the impacts of climate change and, and why did you get into this field? I've been in the field for more than 25 years. A colleague likes to joke that when we first started out, there were so few of us we could have met in a phone booth which is somewhat of an exaggeration, but not as much of an exaggeration as I would like that to be. Climate change was not considered mainstream, shall we say, in health for most of the time I've been in the field. It wasn't that long ago that I proposed a session on climate change and health at a conference for one of the the major organizations. And the response was, climate change has got nothing to do with health. Why would we have that at our conference? And that's been the attitude for most of the time. As I said, it's rapidly shifting with huge interest in incorporating climate change into academic programs, into departments of health. And so it's been really gratifying to see this very rapid shift Have there been any particular moments throughout your career that have stuck with you as surprising or or impactful in some way? One moment that was impactful for me is when the Paris Agreement was gaveled down. Following the gaveling down, countries can 
make a few remarks. They're called interventions. And countries thanked the scientists. They said that they could not have reached this without all the work that we've been doing. And that was just a remarkable statement. Another moment that stands out is 2007, 2008, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Vice President Al Gore and to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it was a powerful statement that climate change is complex. They did not award the Peace Prize to one or two individuals. They awarded it to an organization that works with hundreds of scientists to write these consensus reports and showing how important it is that each one of us as a scientist can contribute and that our contributions matter. So do you technically have a Nobel Peace Prize? I I talked with the Nobel Committee. I technically have a beautiful certificate acknowledging my contributions to the IPCC winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, good. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. So in, in general, how hopeful are you for Earth's future? I tell everybody I'm a worried optimist, that there is lots of very positive change going on, and there's lots of risks that we face. It's fortunate to be in an academic environment because you see the energy and enthusiasm of the students and how much they want to work to make a difference in this space. And that gives me lots of hope for the future, despite the risk that we face. The other is that we didn't talk about mitigation, about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But it's important to recognize the energy transition is underway. People talk about the transformation we need, and it's often framed as transformation in the future. But in fact, that future is here. The story I'm telling everybody these days is I recently went grocery shopping. I'm carrying my groceries back to my car in an underground parking garage. I heard wind chimes, and I actually stopped. I was trying to figure out how I could hear wind chimes with all of the concrete in this parking garage. I calculated the distance to the exit. I was thinking of everything outside the exit. I just couldn't figure out where the wind chimes were coming from. I finally recognized I did not hear a single internal combustion engine. All I was hearing was electric vehicles. They all have to make a noise at low speed. It's a tinkling noise. They all make different noises at low speed. And when you've got several electric vehicles running, it all sounded like wind chimes. Like, that's what it's going to be like to go into an underground parking garage. It's not going to be so noisy. It's not going to be stinky. It's going to be little tinkling noises that sound like wind chimes. As there's even a greater move to electric vehicles. So there's lots of examples of change that's ongoing that's important and is putting us on the right path for reducing our emissions. We have to do it faster, we have to ramp up our efforts, and they're already underway. Right? I would love to be thanked by the Nobel Prize Committee, even if it's just, quote unquote, just a certificate <laughs> instead of a full Nobel Peace Prize. But I, I think it's really interesting, a really interesting approach to talking about climate change mitigations to be saying, yes, it's a very serious issue. And we have to drastically accelerate our efforts to cut carbon emissions in order to avoid catastrophic impacts. But also, the things we need to do to cut carbon emissions are things that are going to just make life better in general. Yeah, like a win-win. Yeah, and of course, part of those wins is public health. Chris has a whole list of how climate mitigation efforts will also coincidentally improve health outcomes. There's major categories of approaches to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. One is reducing the amount of air pollution that comes out of coal fire power plants. A second big category is reducing emissions that come from transportation. The third major category is diet. Cattle, sheep produce a lot of methane, which is a greenhouse gas, and they're a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. For each one of these, there's health benefits. Lots of studies showing that kids that live near coal fire power plants, higher rates of asthma, higher rates of hospitalizations, 
more premature deaths in adults. And overall, when you look at outdoor air pollution, not just from coal-fired power plants, but all outdoor air pollution, about 4 million people die needlessly every year from air pollution. So reducing the sources of those air pollution, hugely beneficial for health. Similarly, for transportation, we reduce what comes out of tailpipes. We switch to electric vehicles, but also we can get more people walking and biking. When people walk and bike regularly, they lose weight, their blood pressure goes down, their cholesterol goes down, reduces the rates of chronic diseases, makes people healthier overall, improves our mental health. For diet, there's a similarly very large body of literature showing that consumption of red meat over what your doctor recommends is associated with higher cholesterol, higher blood pressure, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of stroke. And so if people reduce to what their doctor recommends, then their health also is much better and you reduced all those emissions from cattle and sheep and other livestock. There are studies in all three domains that are quantifying if you do implement certain mitigation policies, then how many avoided hospitalizations could you see? How many avoided premature deaths? Economists like to value those. And the numbers for each one of these are that if we take these actions for mitigation, they reduce overall health care costs. People have healthier, longer lives. We don't lose so many people prematurely. And the costs are of the same order of magnitude, if not larger than the cost of mitigation. That we clearly should be mitigating for our health, and we should be framing mitigation around the health benefits of knowing that doing so will help ourselves be healthier today and in the future, as well as being healthier for our family, our friends, our colleagues, and, and so forth. If you'd like a more interesting and entertaining summary of that, there is a rapper called Baba Brinkman who does science-based raps. And he has a rap called Climate Hero. And the Climate Hero rap was released in December. And it summarizes the health benefits of mitigation policies in a, as I said, perhaps more interesting and certainly far more entertaining way than I just did. So I would recommend looking at that. Please tell me we have this rap to listen to. Yeah, well, obviously, after hearing Chris talk about this rap, I did reach out to Baba Brinkman and ask if we could use part of the song in this episode. So, yes, we do have it. Oh, yay, let's hear it. Climate change, sacrifice and pain. But mitigation brings surprise and gains. Gains, greenhouse gas, air pollution, interactions and synergies. Room for improvement, build for humans, public transportation, bike lanes, fewer cars and less pavement. Motivated by climate mitigation. I just watch the drop in hospitalizations. Quantification of whatever destroys us. All that coal, gas and oil emits poisons. Industrial sectors make electric choices. Tens of millions of future deaths avoided. Decades of better health. Take into account the cost of mitigation really pays for itself before the effect on climate change is felt. So all my heroes better save yourselves. Cheers to the planet and we got health into the glaciers. May they never melt. You can be the hero to someone else, but the one that you say might be yourself. Be yourself, just be yourself. The one that you say might be yourself. Go be the hero to someone else. And you might say. This is so cool. I, I, one, I think this is fantastic. Yeah, and, and Vicky, you and I were talking. Baba Brinkman was actually at our annual meeting a handful of years back now. Right. But I, I remember like literally hearing him across the hall from the room I was in. Oh, I didn't get to see him at all. That was that's a bummer that I didn't get to see him. But did you hear the line that the one that you might save might be yourself or whatever the line? Was I know. Like that? Oh my god. It's it's very uh yeah it's it's. Definitely uh, a really good message. And yeah, really excited that we got to include it in here. 
Yeah. And Bob Brinkman, he told me over email that he actually has a whole science rap album that's going to be released soon on Spotify and other streaming platforms. And it's supposed to include this Climate Hero song and a whole bunch of other science raps. And if you want to find more information, you can go to music.bobabrinkman.com. And I think we can include that link on the third pod webpage as well. Yes, we can. Okay, great. But yeah, Climate Hero it definitely seemed like a pretty good summary of a lot of the things that Chris was talking with us about. Yeah, it's also such an optimistic note to end on. Listening to Christy and the Baba Brinkman rap, I guess I'm more excited to see our future instead of just scared, I guess. I guess there's still a lot to worry about, but also things to like rally around or be excited about with each other. Yeah, certainly. And I, I want to thank Christy for the great work that she does. And with that, that is all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Katrina for bringing us the story and to Christy for sharing her work. This episode was produced by Katrina with audio engineering from Colin Warren and artwork by Jay Steiner. And be sure to head over to the Care of the Two podcast next week for more from Christy on the math and science front. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the podcast, so please rate and review us. And you can find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. All right. So this is this is a climate themed series. And while I, I'm sure I, I have some guesses, I'm not entirely sure kind of about the direct connections of uh, in this instance with things like heat exhaustion and, and studying the climate. But I think I I'm very confident that our producer, Katrina, oh my gosh, Katrina. Katrina. I, Could, I can't. <laughs> It definitely makes sense that in addition to the obvious direct health impacts, that mental health would... Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Why? Okay. Just kind of get our voices warmed up today. (laughs) I'm just reading. Like, it's not even me, my inability to improvise. I'm literally just reading. Fridays, man. Oh, all right.